This is a video about a mechanic I love, a commander card I hate, and a bizarre deck I built out of spite. Our tale begins in 1998, with Urza's saga bringing all sorts of horrendous bullshit to the world, and also a gift, the cycling mechanic. It's a beautifully simple mechanic. You can pay an alternate cost on a card and discard it in order to draw a card. This began in simple fashion during Urza block, but five years later Onslaught block added a ton of dimension to the mechanic. Varied cycle costs, triggers attached to cycle abilities, cycling for basic land types, and six cards with triggered abilities when other cards were cycled. These six were varying power levels, with one in particular being just excellent, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Cycling has seen additional prints every few years since, and for a simple reason, people like this mechanic. As an alternate cost ability, it adds a lot of flexibility to cards, which leads to interesting decision making. Every cycling card a player draws prompts the question, is this card better than a different card plus a small mana commitment? This is nice in aggro when running out of gas might be a concern, and it's even more useful in a control deck where that mana cost can be spent on the end of an opponent's turn, or even in response to things to dig for answers. On top of this, since cycled cards are discarded and go to the graveyard, they work well with graveyard synergies, providing a near effortless way to put cards in the yard. And that's only the playstyles helped out by the mechanic innately. Remember that cool Onslaught card I mentioned earlier? Astral Slide has seen a ton of experimentation ever since it was printed, as it synergizes with many different cards and offers a ton of flexibility. As a result, it was kind of understood as the core of any cycling deck before 2020. Astral Slide decks have a super interesting playstyle that revolves heavily around strategic resource management, and in a way that feels very in line with the fundamental nature of the mechanic. Number of cycling cards in hand constantly dictates the strategic direction of the deck. When you have more, you can get bolder and set up for more daring turns, as well as using slide triggers more liberally, as blocker elimination to net small value off ETBs and so forth, or casting a card normally. By contrast, when you have fewer cycling cards in hand, each one is pure gold. You always want to save them for protecting a critical creature or disrupting a dangerous play from an opponent, but if you feel the game slipping away, you can also choose to gamble that lifeline on an end step for a little bit of value. In addition, mana is a super important resource for both Astral Slide and the mechanic as a whole, as land counts dictate how safe you feel playing setup pieces and how bursty your turns can be. A more controlling cycling deck constantly forces a player to think probabilistically. If I spend mana to play a spell on my turn, what are the odds I'll be able to handle a key threat on my opponent's turn if it gets played? What are my odds of drawing an additional cycling card, or an answer off the top? How much mana would I need to have the best chance of averting death in a worst case scenario? These questions are also fundamentally tied to deck construction, since a player must always weigh the strength of a cycling card versus the cycling cost of it. As a card, a Chroma's Vengeance is wildly more powerful than Winged Shepherd, but if I'm sitting there on an opponent's turn with four mana open, looking down the barrel of defeat, I know which of the two I'd rather have in hand. In short, the cycling mechanic creates and promotes far more textured and strategic gameplay than the vast majority of mechanics in Magic the Gathering. With all of that deep strategic texture in mind, let's talk about Gavi Nestwarden. It's a 5 mana 2-5 who makes the first cycle each turn free, and who creates a cat when you draw your second card each turn. This card is strong enough to be a natural choice for a cycling commander, and also deathly boring. Free cycles on each turn removes an entire dimension of the cycling mechanic, and on top of that, it highly encourages a stable quantity of cycling. One per turn, maybe two on an opponent's turn sometimes. Every cycle past that is a waste, since you have to pay for it, and you don't even get a cute little dino cat, and every turn you fail to cycle is also a waste. Come on, it's free real estate. This ability and the associated incentives remove the status of cycling cards as an important resource to be saved and used carefully, and also in turn leave players with a lot of extra mana that they didn't have to plan out. What does that mana get spent on? Well, permanence to generate value when cards get cycled, of course. Gavi destroys most of the cool strategic decision making generally involved with playing a cycling deck, and replaces it with yet another do the thing value pile midrange deck. The design of most Gavi decks is such that, if you do the thing, cycling in this case, you get an effortless mixture of card advantage and board advantage spread out over time, just like the other 80% of EDH decks that exist out there. And this isn't because Gavi players are people who like especially boring decks. The card is precision designed to encourage exactly this type of gameplay, even if you build it from scratch rather than buying a precon. It's a betrayal on the part of Wizards of the Coast of everything cool about the cycling mechanic, 
and it creates totally predictable gameplay. Well, except for one thing. You see, the other thing Gavi incentivizes is cards with high cycling costs. This is maybe the one thing about the card that's not dead boring, but not really in a good way. Okay, so this incentivization is most relevant for one specific cycle of cards from Scourge, and since Gavi doesn't pay the bonus cost of Decree of Justice, it's actually mainly relevant for two cards. The first is Decree of Silence. Big whoop, it's a free counterspell you'll have sometimes. Not much to say here. The other is Decree of Annihilation. I'll here deliver a hot take. Nuking lands is maybe okay, maybe pretty cool, if your playgroup is down for that, and also if you actually have a way of ending the game pretty soon after using that wild swing of momentum. But nothing else about Gabby really promotes that sort of deck style. More likely, you'll keep slowly getting cats, everybody's mana base will gradually recover, and congratulations, you've just doubled the length of this game. Gabby into Decree of Annihilation, while certainly unusual, still kind of fails to be interesting. So, we have here this pretty bland commander, and if you ask an EDH player what they think about cycling, she's what they think of. This cool mechanic with a rich history and tons of synergy potential, reduced down to yet another value pile commander. Now, to any Gavi players out there, I want to say, this is not an attack on you, and Gavi is more interesting than a lot of commanders out there. There are still some interesting synergies and fun instant speed plays to be had piloting a Gavi deck. I don't hate it because it's a uniquely bad design, it's not. I hate it because it's a total betrayal of one of my favorite mechanics. And this isn't just about Gabby either. Wizards has a habit of printing what I'll call designer commanders, which I hear used to mean commanders that take a particular mechanic and fully dedicate themselves to it, dictating a very specific and often very boring type of deck based around that mechanic. Another example is Elegeth, Crossroads Augur, taking Scry, a neat top-of-library manipulation mechanic, and literally just replacing it with value in a way that doesn't synergize with anything related to the original mechanic. Cool. These commanders push players toward less interesting decks, and their specificity causes them to offer a narrow range of possible decks to be built. A popular typographic format for this sort of commander is one with two lines of text, one that says, whenever X happens, Y happens, and another that says, whenever enough Ys happen, a Z happens. This is a template that builds its own deck. You run some cards that do X and Y, and maybe some Z payoff if you're feeling nutty. Some people might enjoy this type of deck, and to those people, I have to say, that's great. There are certainly people out there who want these kinds of cards. Newer players, people who don't want to spend too long on deck building, or people who like to make unexpected versions of seemingly straightforward commanders. And I think it's cool that Wizards of the Coast has given them lots of options to work with. But, if you want to try out an alternative form of commander deck building, I'm here to offer you a vision of what that could be. For the rest of the video, I'm going to talk about how I took one look at Gavi and then turned around and built a truly bizarre cycling deck. It started with me absentmindedly cruising through random onslaught cards looking for deck ideas, as one does, and as expected I saw Astral Slide, but also another enchantment I wasn't familiar with, Overbooked Cemetery. These seem kind of neat together, right? One promotes cycling, the other works well after I cycle creatures into the graveyard. With these in my pocket, I decided to include blue as well, since it's a very useful color for both cycling and instant speed shenanigans, and I started shopping around for a commander in Esper colors. My hope was to find a commander that could be a flexible value engine when I flickered cards with Astral Slide, and this was my shortlist. Eventually, I decided all of them were either too generic, too niche, or not the right vibe, all except good old Shroom. With my commander selected, I set some healthy ground rules. No sculpting steel type combos, and a $100 budget. I'm not building a high power Shroom deck, I'm building an Astral Slide deck. A good place to start is always win cons, and one that leapt out immediately was Magister Sphinx, which, combined with Shroom, can one-shot a player. Shroom's nature as a reanimation tool means that a beatdown suite with a number of big flying artifact creatures is likely to be a good bet at $100 cycling deck power levels, and will hopefully offer enough beef to win, even when Magister Sphinx isn't available. However, this beatdown step will likely be tricky unless I'm mostly stabilized against hate and attacks, which can be accomplished through my core card of Astral Slide. The card offers so many use cases. It's a reanimation engine with Shroom, 
It can be a value, removal, ramp, or life gain engine with other artifact creatures, and that's to say nothing of the built-in protection and disruption utility of the card. Since Astral Slide is so key to the deck and I can only run two in the deck, Enchantment Tutors were a must, so I started out with Idyllic Tutor and eventually settled on Xur as my other tutor. His wizard tag is oddly important, as Wizards of the Coast has printed two wizard cycling cards, basically instant speed wizard tutors that count as a cycle. Out of these strange cards organically grew a toolbox that expanded as I found new hurdles my deck needed to overcome. Wizard cycling grabs a tutor for slide, a tutor for my top end boys, a recursion spell for my slides, and a stifle effect that's also an extra cycle for my big turns. A mixture of tutoring, discard outlets, and my recursion spell commander means that my deck's key pieces generally get into play mana efficiently. The deck does a great job scratching my itch to play a complex and strategic deck, and it does so at a middling power level that feels good in quite a lot of pools. A key takeaway from this deck building process for me was the strength of flexible, ground up deck construction. By starting with a mechanic and a couple key cards and selecting a commander afterward, my deck ended up with a foundation that includes the commander but doesn't wholly consist of the commander. It's built to follow best practices for a cycling deck, and though it does include the occasional stormy element or value engine, each of these pieces are intentional, and most of them are tutorable if I decide that's what a given situation demands. The most important thing I prefer to avoid is having the entire deck stand on the shoulders of the commander, at least not unless you're ready for that kind of responsibility. I could have made the commander Xur, but then the issue of not having a consistent value source, combined with Xur being a removal magnet, would have rapidly turned my deck into one more Xur than Astral Slide, as draw enchantments and protection spells gobble up my deck space. It's good to keep in mind the sort of deck building incentives a given commander pushes onto you, as even one that seems like a good idea on paper might make your deck take a turn that isn't what you were looking for. If I was to wrap this up with a bow, I'd go with this. When you're building a deck, figure out what the deck wants to do, and try to turn that into a somewhat focused plan. Except that you won't nail the first version of the deck, and that there's room to adapt as you encounter further problems. I'd say there are four key versions of a single deck. The first principles version in your brain, the draft version after you actually hammer out a 100 card list, the streamlined version completed after you solo playtest a bit, and the final version completed after you played against other people for a little while. Each of these steps will solve a different set of problems that the deck has, and that's a strength.